Hello, listeners. Welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 272 of Sustainable Minimalists. On today's show, we are discussing what it takes to thrive on purpose. And specifically, we're talking about flexibility as it relates to prioritizing our priorities. Today, I am speaking with social impact expert and author, Wendy Telecki. Wendy and her co-authors have a new book out today, and it's titled Rebalance, How Women Lead, Parent, Partner, and Thrive. And in our conversation today, Wendy leans on her knowledge as a parent of three children, one who's graduating high school this year, as well as her social impact career to impart on us how we can all prioritize our priorities, yes, but practice flexibility as we seek to live intentional lives. We are going to get straight into my conversation with Wendy after a quick word from today's sponsor. And we're back. Wendy, I'm so excited to talk to you. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. I'm thrilled to talk to you. Your new book, Rebalance, sounds so lovely. Tell us who you are, what you do, and the most interesting place you've ever visited. I'm Wendy Telecky, and I'm a mother. I have three teenage uh, children. I also work at the World Bank. I run a major program to support women entrepreneurs around the world. So in my life, I've had to travel quite a bit. I have to say one of my favorite places to go where I'm hoping to go again soon is Bali in Indonesia. And the reason is because it's such a deep cultural place where really people have been able to maintain lives and lifestyles that really reflect the balance that we're trying to talk about in this book. Never been to Bali. It's on my list. It's worth it. Worth a visit. (laughs) Before we get into our main conversation today about flexibility in all facets of daily life, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what rebalancing means. It's the title of your forthcoming book. How does rebalancing a life relate to flexibility? Great. Thanks for that question. We spent a lot of time actually trying to think about what we wanted to call this book. We've been running a network of women, a group of women that we've called the Thrive Group for a long time, because that group of women who all had young children and important careers in social impact areas really were trying to find a way to thrive across the many different elements of their lives. And as we thought about what messages we wanted to come out of this book, we really realized a lot of our lessons and a lot of the learnings that we've had over those 10, 15 years of being together and talking about the many challenges had to do with the reset moments, the points in time when you really have to think about what's working and what's not working and the times you have to pull back on certain things and the times you have to lean into things. And taking that moment, it can be a very short moment, a brief moment to just reflect and think about what's out of balance and what needs to be rebalanced. And that moment when you're reflecting and thinking about that is when you have to be comfortable changing things and having the flexibility to go with what's important in the moment and to step back from the things that maybe are taking a lot of your time, but not not really giving you what they need, or they're just not the most important things anymore. So it really, it took, first of all, a lot of forgiveness because you set an intention and then there's many ways you fail as you set this intention. And every time you do, you have to forgive yourself and be comfortable with being good enough. And we talk a lot about that in the book, about perfect can be the enemy of the good. And when you try to do everything perfectly, you're really setting yourself up for for failure. So having expectations from the outset, we will not be perfect, but we will do our best every day. So we called the book Rebalance because we wanted to really focus on that moment when you need to stop and think and be intentional about how you design your own life. This is an intentional living podcast, and I'm really thrilled to talk to you about the importance of flexibility, simply because that is not a strong suit for me. I am ridiculously inflexible, bullheaded, stubborn. You can name, there's so many adjectives that can be used to describe me. And so I don't feel like the expert in this at all. 
I'm sure there are people listening right now who are like me and who are black and white thinkers. So there's either you're doing it or you're not. And the gray area in the middle is nowhere you want to be. Either you're doing whatever it is, 100% to the best of your ability, or you're not trying at all. Do you have any words to say to people like me who are so black and white in their thinking and their actions where if I'm going to put 100% effort in, I expect 100% positive results? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that we tried to reflect on in this book was the fact that we can try to have it all or be everything, but it's really impossible to do and be everything all at once. And so again, you have to be able to have forgiveness of yourself and say, this is something I want to be perfect on. I want to be, it's, I'm so committed to it. I want to really focus on this and let some of the other things go. And maybe you say, it's not for me now. This is something for a later point in my life. We've gone through in the conversations we've had with the 12, 15 years of conversations, and things change a lot. Even as your children's age change, things change. So what's possible this year might not be possible next year, and it might be possible again in later years. So also thinking about things and how they work over time. So in our lives, I think we do have to say, what are the priorities? What do we need to get 100% right? And what are the things that are nice to have, but that they're not going to be the things that we want to really hold ourselves up to those high standards. We, We try to manage that balance in that way. I like what you said there. I'm going to paraphrase you and please correct me if I get this wrong, but maybe what we need to do is to prioritize our priorities, right? So we have a list of things that are priorities, but of those 10-ish things, let's say, whatever those 10 things are for you, for me, then prioritize those, like rank list them. There are some things in my life that I may not necessarily be willing to compromise or be flexible on and others that perhaps I can. Do you feel as though being flexible, the act of pivoting. Do you think those are skills that can be learned or is it an an innate personality characteristic? I think it's a little bit of both. I think certainly some people are born with more flexibility. We've, we all, if we have children, we know every child is different and they are definitely born with certain traits and being stubborn is one and flexible is a different trait. I think as mothers, though, we also influence that a lot by how we we buy into or dissipate those energies of our children. So if we can help our children feel more comfortable or having making sure they're setting the right expectations for themselves and for others, making them feel more comfortable with failure for trying things and then accepting failure and failure is not a problem. I think those things really do help us teach our children. For those of us who are adults and have patterns that are very hard to break, I do think we can make a difference. We have to be mindful about it though, and we need to be really, really purposeful about it. So many times we don't like to say no. We always like to be perfect. We should reframe that as a yes. So when you're saying you're going to let your standard slide or you're going to pivot to do something else, It's not that you're stopping doing one thing. It's saying yes to something else that's more important. So if you can think about it in that positive light, I think that's a very helpful way to frame it. And so some of those things that might not be perfect or that you want to, you want to leave behind, it's a yes to something else. You brought up children there and a lot of my listeners do have children, but I'm thinking about my own children. What's more impactful for children? It's to have a flexible spontaneous parent who's not so stuck in the agenda and the to-do list and can drop everything, let's say, and go get ice cream on a Tuesday night or whatever the thing may be. And when we talk about parenting, what is the best way to instill values in our children? It's by modeling. And so that's something I need to think about as a mother. But you argue that the edge of the wheel is where we all should want to be. 
What mm-hmm. on earth does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so when we wrote this book, we had been using for these this 10 years of conversations an exercise when we would get together and we wanted to get a full picture of where each of us stood in our lives. It was It's a wheel. And essentially, the idea behind the wheel, it's very simple. It's something anybody can do at any time. You take a piece of paper and you draw a circle on it. You think through what are the most important elements of your life, the key priorities in your life, your children, your job, your spirituality, whatever those elements are, everybody's elements will be very different. And you put those in the the circle is slices of pie or slices of life. And then what you do is you think about what is the edge of the wheel for you in each of those areas? Where do you want to be in that moment? Not what's the ideal, what's the perfect mom or what's the perfect career, but where do you want to be today? And that's the edge of the wheel. And then you shade in from the inside out in each of those slices where you think you are. So you might be 50%, you might be 90%, you might be 10% in one of those slices and the opposite in the other. And once you look at that circle, it's a very powerful tool to see where you see the biggest gaps are in your life because the white space between where you've shaded in and the edge of the wheel really shows you in very graphical terms where you feel like you want to be doing better, not where other people think you should be doing better, your perfect view of yourself. So think about what really you want at that moment in time then figure out how you need to rebalance to get to the edge of the wheel in those different areas. And the nice thing about the wheel exercise is you can do it over and over. Your wheel this month might be different from next month or next year. So we redo that wheel every time we uh, have one of our larger meetings. And it's always different. Even the slices can change. So sometimes something that's important at one point, like for example, elderly parents, Many of us have elderly parents who probably we wouldn't have put our elderly parents in as a slice of the pie in our 30s. But now that they're getting older, they become a more important part of what we're thinking about focusing on with our time. And so those things come and go and and they change over time. I love the wheel visual. I am in the habit of every month essentially grading myself on a sliding scale on, and I don't do this myself, my planner does it for me the first of the month, but I put in my own values, my own grading on the sliding scale on a spectrum would be a better word for how I'm doing in terms of my personal relationships, my family life, my self-care, my fun, my profession. So all these categories that tend to be important for most of us listening, right? And I learned very quickly from doing this, from this visual on this spectrum, I got to, you know, put a little point on the line that I cannot be killing it. I cannot be 100% awesome in all the categories. It's just impossible. It's, it's impossible for me, even as a person who has designated these categories as really important to me, I still can't do them all great. So for when you say the edge of the wheel is where you want to be, that really does speak to me because some months, some weeks, some days, some priorities require 100% effort. And then it's okay then that the other ones, the other priorities get less or even none. But then I have to ask you about the how to, and we're going to, we're going to talk like, How do you (laughs) reprioritize? How do you pivot? So we're going to get there after a quick word from this week's sponsor. It's not summer in my backyard without a glass of rosé in my hand. And that's because every day is the perfect day for celebrating. I'm over here celebrating great weather. I'm celebrating the end to a successful school year. And most importantly, I'm celebrating the fact that in 2022, I can get my favorite bottle of wine, as well as beer and spirits, delivered from Drizzly without ever leaving my Adirondack chair. Life is good. Drizzly is the number one app for alcohol delivery, and that's because they let you shop across stores, so you get the best deal on exactly what you're looking for. Just download the Drizzly app or head to drizzly.com, and right now, new customers can get $5 off their first order with promo code FAST5 at checkout. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y 
with promo code FAST5 at checkout. And we are back. We are discussing flexibility in all facets of life. And Wendy, we're on to the part of today's conversation where I feel like I need the most help, which is the how to. You also say that it's important to remember, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Can you speak more to that as it relates to your life? So I have a career. It's quite time consuming and intensive. And I travel a lot. And we were very lucky. COVID in a way had some benefits for those of us who had busy travel schedules, because we were really able to spend more time at home and and more time with our family. But the reality is time is very limited. And it's very limited when you know, you're working, you have children, as I said, I've got three teenagers, a husband, elderly parents also want to be involved in my community and in social issues. And I want to be able to do all of these things, but I'm not able to be perfect. And let me just talk about parenting and perfection in in parenting. I grew up with my parents divorced very early on. They had a very amicable divorce. And I would spend my weekends in New York City with my father. And during the week, I would be with my mother in Connecticut. And my mother was a sailor. And so on the weekends, she would go sailing. She was a racer and she would sail on on long overnight races. And she worked as well. So she was a working mother also with three children. And growing up, I had a lot of independence and she was around when we needed her, but she was not in our space all the time. We were home alone or taking the train back and forth to New York. Growing up with that... She was very unapologetic about what she did. And we saw that what she did, she loved. And she was an adventurer and an amazing free spirit. And we saw that that gave her joy. And that taught us also to be joyful and more spontaneous and more willing to follow our dreams. For me, what that has taught me as a parent is that my children need me to show them what brings me joy so that they can also have that in their lives. And they do not need me to be the creator of all of the joy in their lives. They also need to learn and I need to help them find the way to find their joy. So when we think about parenting, it also often comes with a big dose of guilt that we're not doing enough, that we're not hands-on enough, especially for working moms or you know, moms who have lots of other obligations. And what I've always tried to take away from my own experience is you don't need to be a perfect parent in order to have great kids. Your kids actually need to see that you are flawed also, that you are human, because that gives them permission to be so as well. And we need to really be able to embrace our own health, our own well-being, and our own joy in order to be that role model for our children. So I think there's many ways that we need to question our assumptions about what perfect is. And we can talk about health and careers and lots of other things. But I think in parenting, we really suffer a lot from holding ourselves to these very high standards. And it's not always benefiting us or our children. Yes, you're so right. How do I want my children to remember me? I want them to remember me as somebody who is happy and, again, spontaneous. I'm the opposite of spontaneous. But that then brings me to the how-to. This isn't a natural thing for me. And I'm sure for some listeners listening, flexibility does not come naturally to them. So how do you let go of oversized expectations? And how do you train yourself essentially, to be slightly more flexible? Well, I think we need to find ways to get out of our ruts. We need to talk to people around us who can be our support network, so who can help us uh, find ways to get out of our ruts or call us out when we're doing things that we're trying not to do. Definitely. And it's not only your spouse or your colleague or your friend, but also your children. We have a very funny story in the book where one of my co-authors was, their son was saying, oh, can you come out and throw the ball around with me, mom? And the 
daughter said, oh, don't, dad's the one that plays, mom's the one that works. And those moments, our children also see what we're doing and they can call us out. So we should be listening to them as well and finding ways to get them to help you find that flexibility and find that spontaneity. I mean, there's no one better uh, than them to try to do that. Yeah, that story with the ball and playing catch really does resonate with me. I feel as though because my husband is the more spontaneous one, and he often leans into that role, then I have to lean into the opposite, which is generally clean up the kitchen after dinner, start the bath, etc. I have to be more rigid in the schedule because he's naturally more, more spontaneous. And to balance out the household, we each tend to go to our corners. But Bringing our conversation back to rebalancing, what's step one? Let me, I just want to touch on the point you made about spouses, because we also talk quite a bit about that in the book and how we allow ourselves to be put into these roles that uh, we're not totally comfortable with. And we're at the same time that we're doing that, we're putting our husband into a role and they might not only want to be in that role either. So a lot of the conversations we've had about spouses have been about giving the spouse the room to lead on many of the things that we think of typically the mom thing, or we feel like that's the the burden of being the mom or that the issue is they are not going to do it exactly the way we do it. So if we have a perfection tendency, if we tend to believe there's a right way to do something and a wrong way to do things, we're naturally going to avoid giving our spouse things to do that we think they won't do perfectly either. And so giving them the space to do things in an imperfect way, in a way that wouldn't be the way we would do it, but the kids will survive is really important also for our own well-being. So giving over some of those things that you may think are a burden, but could be fun if your spouse is doing it is a way to switch up those dynamics and, and to give yourself some room to say, oh yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. Everything will be okay, even if it doesn't turn out exactly the way I would have wanted it. You're so right. And when I go into my corner of being the scheduler, the planner, the cleaner upper, the household manager, as a response to him being the fun parent, let's say, what I'm really doing is I'm reinforcing a gender role that I don't want my daughters to take into adulthood, into their relationships going forward. Thank you for saying that. Back to rebalancing, though. What is step one? You mentioned being intentional, sitting down. Talk to me more about that. Yeah. So we uh, talk a lot in Rebalance about finding your North Star and finding the values that you think are most important. And actually, when we draw the wheel around the outer circle of the wheel are your core values. What are the values that are most important to you? And how do you want to live your life? So having a strong voice or agency or bringing gratitude into your life. Those are the things that we we think about. So thinking through the shape of your life, what are those core values? And then again, going through and thinking through how do you let go of things when you look at the wheel? And I recommend everybody do the wheel. What are the things you can let go of? So it seems strange. You want to start, if you're making your to-do list, it's all the things you want to do. But actually thinking about what is what are the things that you might need to say no to so that you can say yes to other things, I think is very important. And then think about where you're asking too much of yourself. So where your expectations of perfection might be too high and where you can you set different expectations for yourselves or, or have areas of forgiveness. We all are doing so much in our lives. So there's always, and there's always more to do. There's no end to the number of amazing things that we can do. And at one point we talk in the book about all the books on the bookshelf, right? All the the self-help books and the knowledge books and the literature and all these things that we want to achieve. It's a metaphor for all the things things in our lives we think can be better that we can add on. And there's just not a need to always uh, be doing that. So thinking about what's really important is the most important thing and then what can be taken away. Hmm. Your answer there really makes me think about time. Our time on this planet is finite and it goes by very quickly. I'm learning that (laughs) every day as my kids are actually growing up before my eyes, 
Uh, I'm learning that time is speeding by. And what a trite statement, right? Like life passes in the blink of an eye. When my elders, when I was younger, when they said that, I just rolled my eyes and thought, oh, you're so old. But now here I am saying it. And it's true. It's a truism because it's actually true. We don't have time to do all the things and do them all well. So spinning this back around to prioritizing your priorities, being intentional about how you want to spend your life, what you want to do, I think really is step one. Today is literally the last day of high school for my son, my eldest child. And so that reflection is very, you know, true for me that this feeling that time speeds by, but that can also be uh, a tool for us to know that we are in a phase today and we will be in a different phase tomorrow. Those things that we feel like we should be accomplishing everything right now, when you think about it over a longer time frame, it actually becomes easier to let things go because you can always come back to them later. So when I had three children under three, I have because I have twins, there were many things that just had to not happen. And there were some things that were critically important that did have to happen and had to be done well. And there had to be this massive winnowing. And I remember thinking, when does this end? <laughs> the, you know, it's very grueling physically to have such young children and thinking, gosh, when will this end? And there is a time for everything. And I think as parents, we feel that in a very, in sometimes like a very mournful way, but other times we can think of it as really a joyful way of thinking about stages. And children change a lot. So as you think about your kids growing up, you have to realize you do get these big gaps in time as your children start wanting to spend all their time with other people. But those things, those pockets that arrive because your children are changing and their needs are changing can also create space for really beautiful new things to happen. Yes. And while the children are changing and pockets of space are happening, I would say too that it's also happening for us. And it's taking those pockets of space, those moments in time, being intentional, being mindful, and allowing yourself to rebalance to the change in seasons. Wendy, tell us about your new book. It's triple authored. I'm going to say the title one more time, and then you tell me what it's about and where my listeners can find it. So the title is Rebalance, How Women Lead, Parent, Partner, and Thrive. And what a good title that is, by the way. <laughs> yes, thank you. It took us a while to work on it, and, and here it is. My co-authors, as I mentioned, are Monica Brand Engel and Lisa Fernandez Newberger. And the three of us spent 10 years as part of a group uh, called Thrive that would meet once a month to just talk through. We all had social impact careers that were keeping us busy, keeping us on the road. We all had young children. We all had community activities that we were involved in and the volunteer activities that we were doing, spouses uh, who also we wanted to make sure that relationship remained strong. And we, as we talked through these issues and these issues changed as our kids get o- got older, we started seeing pattern recognitions, similar things happening, and similar ways of thinking about things across all of our lives. So the book actually takes the shape of the wheel. It goes, each chapter is a different pie slice. So we go through things related to work, things related to family, things related to our own personal health and well being, and also to our engagement with the community, our friends, networks, and our broader social impact. Wendy, I loved everything about our conversation. But before we go, I have to ask you, if you had to impart one piece of knowledge you've gained, I know you said your child is graduating high school today. Congratulations, by the way. If you had to impart one piece of advice on mothers with young children, what would it be? I think relax. The children will be okay. Every mother I know is an amazing mother and the children will be great. What you need to do is help them find what they love and show them that you are able to find what you love and they will be okay. They will be great. Lead with love. Do what you love. Lead them in that direction and everything will be fine. Wendy, I just want to thank you so much. You have given me 
so much wisdom to think about. (laughs) And I want to wish you so much success with the book. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun and really great to talk to you about all these things. Listeners, that's a wrap. I have linked to Wendy, to the book's website, and to the book Rebalance that is out today in this week's show notes, which you can find at mamaminimalist.com forward slash 272. I have nothing to say at the end of today's show, so I'm just going to say goodbye. I will see you on Thursday. Reach out to me if you need me and take care.